Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Patterson from Calm Healthy Horses and tonight we're going to talk about the connection between your horse's pasture grass and the vast array of issues that seem to be plaguing modern day horse owners. Now we're going to cover exactly what it is about the grass that can cause you, you know, right from minor issues like your horse getting a bit spooky from time to time or maybe having trouble with canter transitions right through to major issues like laminitis or head shaking that can completely derail your horse owning experience. So don't worry, we also have solutions which we find work consistently well. So let's bring the screen up. Here we go. And I thought we'd just start with a little bit about how Calm Healthy Horses actually came about. Well, years ago, I got bucked off one of my horses and it was one of those episodes where I landed really hard and I couldn't walk for a week. So that got me thinking that maybe, you know, I'm missing something here. I'm not uh, doing enough groundwork. I'm not being a good enough leader. And right about then came the into New Zealand, the first horsemanship clinics. So to cut a long story short, I went along, got really involved, you know, practice, got my instructor's certificate, and I started teaching um, other people the same skills all around New Zealand for the next 12 or so years. Now, what that entailed was going to the same places every eight to 10 weeks. So I would you know, see the same horses and the same people. Now, we would be regularly scratching our head about what was going on with our horses because maybe the last time I was there, all the horses seemed to be good. We'd make progress. We'd all have a good time. But the next time I went to that same place with the same horses, it was like those horses were completely different. Some of them, you'd go to touch them even, and they would lash out or they'd reach around and try and bite you or maybe by this time they were having trouble with the canter when they never had trouble before all sorts of things and of course finally you know over the years the penny drops and of course the last time I would have been to that area would have been in the middle of winter and now it was mid-spring or it might have been the middle of summer um, when the grass had dried off last time and this time it was mid-autumn and of course you know, there'd been changes in the grass. And then about, you know, towards the end of those 12 years, I lost my precious horse, Lanty, the um, horse in the picture there. And that really got me started on the whole nutrition, um, you know, experience and learn curve. So what exactly does Calm Healthy Horses do? Well, what we do is we respond to inquiries to help people to resolve issues. These are inquiries from all over the world, um, mainly, I guess, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, but also Europe, Scandinavia, North America, uh, and South Africa. Uh, we get inquiries from everywhere it seems that green grass grows. What we do is we give in-depth management advice because we know from years of experience, that's what's required. And of course, over the years, because there has been a need, because, you know, we learned, you know, aspects of the grass that uh, where certain supplements are required, we have developed our own range of supporting supplements. Now, the people that uh, contact us inevitably have been down multiple avenues already. And so most of them are at their wits end, like the people that gave uh, horses to us, you know, when we were taking on horses with these issues. That's how we've learnt uh, by practical experience what works and what doesn't work. So the horse on the right there that Sue, our UK distributor, is riding, that's Cloud, he had been diagnosed uh, by muscle biopsy as PSSM2. He also had EMS fat pads and laminitis had been a worry. 
He didn't sweat. He was extremely nappy and was very good at planting and rearing. Now, his previous owners were very dedicated and they had spared no effort or expense in trying to get cloud right. Multiple veterinary examinations, x-rays, blood tests, body work, you name it, cloud had it. But it ne nothing ever seemed to stick or really work. So in the end, they were willing to give cloud to Sue. Sue and I had met Cloud and his owners on one of my previous trips to the UK. So Sue took Cloud on and, of course, kept him on her, uh, with her other horses on her track uh, and fed him the same and rode him tactfully, especially at the beginning, gave him the time that he needed. And now, of course, Cloud completely back to an, being a normal fabulous riding horse he's now Sue's you know main riding horse and she even takes him out competing and jumping now the chestnut horse on the left there is a horse that I was got I was given uh years ago when he was a chronic you know serious head shaker now the sad thing is about Lockie is that he would have made most women their absolute dream horse. He is so well-mannered, so well-schooled, so easy to have around that, you know, it's it's a shame that we haven't been able to rehome him. The only reason being is that people don't have the facilities, you know, to keep a horse like Lockie off the grass. So I learned a lot from rehabbing Lockie from his head-shaking self back to a normal horse and I haven't we haven't seen him head shake for three or four years now so you know we take on horses with these issues and so we have the you know the hard out experience so we've observed that there are assumptions being made out there the one of the main ones being that horses eat grass of course they do eat grass but all grass is not equal and they, uh, the sort of grass that most of us have available in our fields or paddocks isn't the grass that happens to suit horses. There are other assumptions, you know, that it's only the sugars aspect of the grass that causes the problems. And we're going to show you in future slides how that's absolutely not the case. And... People think that when their horse starts getting footy or starts flicking his head or starts getting tight muscles, they tend to think that's the start of their problems when they see those uh, sort of symptoms arising. Whereas in actual fact, the, you know, the horse, horse's metabolism has been brewing along subclinically for quite some time and it just takes a change in the grass or the season or the weather for these symptoms to show up on the outside. So you'd look at the video on the right with all that beautiful forage and the freedom those horses have got and you'd think that will be an ideal environment but in actual fact all of those horses developed metabolic issues of one sort or another and they are now kept off that grass that grass is made into hay and silage for them so they're fed it that way so the consequences of not understanding the information that we're explaining tonight um, are vast you've got not only your cost cost of investigations treatments, lost riding time, wasted lessons. Uh, it can even cost you horses, sadly. It's cost us in the past not understanding. Um, but it can also, if you don't look out, cost you years. So we don't want you guys to, you know, be like us and end up looking back on horses we've owned in the past and wishing we'd known then what we know now. More and more horses are being tested for this and that and assigned labels. Now we're quite concerned about this because once a horse is assigned a label, 
everybody thinks it's the horse that's defective. Whereas actually it's his management that is defective. And it is a tall order to take on horses like the horse on the left there and you know, bring them back to optimal health. If you don't have the uh, facilities and if you don't have the experience and if you don't have the support through the process and uh, you know those are things that we obviously help you with. Now fundamentally the changes in the grass that we mentioned they affect the horse's body chemistry because horses are mammals like us and really we are sophisticated chemistry machines and if the body chemistry goes astray or awry, then everything goes astray. You know, the horse's metabolism, um, the disturbances will show up in a variety of different ways. So if you don't fix the underlying forage issues, everything else really can easily become just a Band-Aid and you'll be forever looking for that simpler solution. So just a bit of background, where are horses designed to live? Well, horses evolved on the great plains and steppes of the Northern Hemisphere, North America and Europe, where these are semi-arid environments, where it is too dry for trees. Now, New Zealand and the UK for that matter, were once covered in trees. What this means is they have over the centuries and millennia have developed very organic soils. Whereas in these semi-arid environments with your grasslands, um, the, the climate is harsh. The, the horses go through long, harsh winters, but over those times, the grass is dormant and also the grass is dormant over the dry times of the summer. So horses are actually adapted to these harsh, cold, dry environments, not the wet ones that humans have move, moved them to. Humans have moved them to more temperate climates like the UK um, and different areas of the world like New Zealand and Australia, where you know it's a completely different environment. And sure, they survive in these environments, but they don't necessarily thrive without a fair bit of help from us. So just to give you the contrast, you've got the semi-arid environment on the left where it hardly ever rains. The, the soil or the dirt, there's hardly any soil actually. The dirt and the grit lacks organic matter, so it doesn't grow very well. So it's rarely green in these environments. And of course, there are no fences, so there's very low stocking rates. As opposed to where we're keeping horses uh, in in uh, these temperate climates, it regularly rains. The soils are organic. Everything grows prolifically all year round. And of course, we put fences up, which restricts the horse's movement. So horses are adapted to a sparse diet where they have to expend energy in searching and, and obtaining food and water. Contrast the zero energy that that horse on the right needs to expend just to drop his head actually gravity drops his head and he just starts a feast so completely different environments and forage that we keep horses on these days what are horses designed to eat well in those semi-arid environments they have a cyclical or seasonal diet so that's where they might see some green in the spring but then uh, that's after a long, hard winter. And then they fatten up on the uh, mature grass and seed heads over the rest of summer and autumn, ready for that next long, hard winter where they'll, you know, where life can be um, a bit hard and they probably lose and they lose a lot of weight. They evolved on predominantly grasses. Now, studies have been done which show horses, the 80 to 90% of their diet are grasses, and hence they are monogastrics, not ruminants. So they are not designed for the lush green pastures that are riddled with 
legumes and broadleaf plants that we present them with. They evolved in these low potassium and low nitrogen settings. Um, that's why they're, you know, the fact that they eat the grass is why they have those long heads to accommodate the banks of grinding molars and also why their eyes are positioned towards the top of their head. So in New Zealand and the UK, um, of course, we've got more of an evergreen all year round. Green, we're lucky if it burns off these days. It used to burn off here in New Zealand pretty well everywhere um, for late summer, you know, maybe a month or two. But over the last couple of seasons, we've had regular rain everywhere except Southland. And <clears throat> there hasn't been any time where it's burnt off. So the grass has stayed green all year round. And that means our horses, uh, unless you have the facilities, are out there eating this prolific growth, um, sometimes riddled with the clovers and the broadleaf plants. Now, when it does burn off and the grass is nice and brown and, and coarse and stalky, we can put horses like Lockie out there um, to eat. And of course, that doesn't do him any harm at all. Uh, but, you know, like I say, the, um, the climate seems to have changed lately and we don't seem to get those burnt off times. Now, unsuitable grass, you can see the picture on the top there, that is stressed grass. Now, the reason it is, it is stressed is because it is trying to grow. Uh, it has the, the temperatures, it has the moisture, it it has the nutrients from the soil, but one thing it doesn't have is leaf area because it's grazed all the time. So plants need leaf area to make sugars during the day via photosynthesis, which it utilizes at night to grow more plant. It builds the bricks and mortar of the plant, it builds more stalk. So the plant grows at night usually and uses up the sugars that it makes during the day. But grass that is continually grazed doesn't have enough leaf area to make the sugars. So it accumulates uh, potassium and crude protein because it can't use those up either. Now the grass down below is obviously longer. The, the blades do have leaf area, so it can make sugars. So longer grass is high potassium, high crude protein, and high in sugars. It is far too rich for horses. Now, a lot of ho horse owners would look at that short grass in the top field and think, oh, that looks like it would be quite good because I'm trying to keep my horse's weight in check. So they would think that would be, you know, good for that. But in actual fact, it certainly is not ideal for horses who need their weight kept in check. And it certainly doesn't help horses that are EMS or stop them from getting you know, any of the issues that we're talking about. So I've included this some slides which uh, show the forage analyses because I don't know, people think we cook all this stuff up. So uh, the, what we've actually done over the years is we have gone out and sampled the forage the very forage that the horse was eating when it tipped over into the various issues. Now, the horse that was consuming this very short autumn green grass and clover, he was a thoroughbred. He certainly was not a candidate that you would have thought uh, would have developed laminitis. He uh, was getting some hay every day. Um, but the rest of the day, he was nibbling around on this short green grass and clover. <clears throat> now, one day his owner rang up and said she was distressed because he obviously he couldn't walk. He'd got laminitis. So we raced over there and we had to crawl around on our hands and knees with nail scissors in order to get enough for a sample to send away to be tested. But uh, it was very revealing when we did that because what we found was that the sugars were actually quite low. 
but the crude protein was dangerously high. 36% is extremely high for a crude protein level, and that would cause metabolic troubles for all livestock, dairy cows, sheep, any, any livestock. And the potassium is very high as well, 3.4%. Now, we, because the owner acted quickly and we got the horse off that grass and onto a hay diet and gave it some, you know, appropriate supplements, uh, you know, we managed to avert a full-blown laminitis episode. Now, this grass was spring grass, and you'll see it has a similar pattern. The horse had had multiple bouts of colic over a week in spring and its owner had to get the vet several times and finally she got hold of us and of course we told her to get the horse off that grass onto hay and we also asked her if she would pick a sample of that grass and send it away to Hills Laboratory to be analysed and it shows a similar pattern. Very high potassium, high crude protein, high sugars, <clears throat> I mean, sorry, low sugars, um, around 7%. And, of course, there's nitrates. Now, I didn't mention in the previous slide the nitrates were also high, and that's significant. So the nitrates are also very detectable in this sample. Uh, they should be less than 100 or undetectable. And this grass... This grass turned a quiet hunting horse into a fire-breathing dragon inside three hours. Now, this horse's owner lived on a big farm, and this was a large paddock that they had uh, grown and fertilized for their cattle. It was ryegrass and clover that um, had been fertilized with NPK. And she was going to town one day and was going to be out for about three hours. So she thought she would put the horse out there, you know, while she went to town. So exactly three hours later, when she came back and went to get that horse, she found she had a completely different horse. In fact, the horse, she could hardly catch it. It was, it was off its trolley. <laughs> it was it was very difficult to get the halter on because it was flinging its head around so much. Its eyeballs were rolling. It was climbing with its front legs. She felt very unsafe, but she knew she had to get that horse out of there. And eventually she did, and uh, she got it back to its normal grazing, and it did come right after a few days. But meanwhile, she contacted us, and of course we asked her to go and collect a sample, and we sent that away to be analyzed as well. So you can see that the potassium is also very high, the nitrates are high, the crude protein is high, and the sugars are low. And in actual fact, in, in all of these, the and you find out, you come to find out when you investigate these things, that sugars and crude protein tend to be inversely proportional. Now, I've given you these examples, there are several sort of more extreme examples, your pastures may not be, you know, have those um, very high readings, but it's just to demonstrate, uh, you know, that there are other aspects of the pasture that you need to take into account besides the sugars. Now, nitrates, according to the Mineral Tolerances of Animals book, monogastrics, have zero requirement for nitrates and <clears throat> you know in fact nitrates are a major cause of gastric disturbances that's what it also says in there they become toxic to livestock because they're not adapted to them but they have to be when they're ingested they have to be processed and excreted now, some of them are uh, converted in the liver to urea and excreted in the urine. Others, um, because nitrates are anions, they attract cations. So they kind of, you know, I won't go into this here, but they kind of rob the horse <coughs> of precious calcium and magnesium, especially in the absence of enough salt in the diet. In that way, 
they contribute to mineral imbalances. Now, of course, you know, everybody's aware of the horse's microbiome and we want a healthy microbiome. And nitrates, even at a sort of a subclinically lower level than in those examples I gave you, are going to be affecting the horse's microbiome. And what they do, along with the high potassium, is uh, upset the, the flora. They upset the flora's ability to produce the vitamins. They cause a sort of an inflammatory response of the lining of the intestine. And then you get malabsorption of nutrients and protein and, and everything. All sorts of troubles can emanate from ingesting nitrates at a sort of a chronically low subclinical level or at times when, you know, you, you get, uh, they accumulate like over rows of cloudy days. Now, potassium is a nutrient that you need to be mindful of. K is the sort of chemical symbol for potassium. Horses need potassium, like we all do, to function. <clears throat> but what we need to do is be mindful of the quantities going in on an ongoing basis. <clears throat> We've consistently observed that around 1%, which is what you get in sort of late cut, uh, more mature uh, hay, tends to resolve issues when you get horses on, uh, you know, that sort of hay at that sort of level. Um, things improve as opposed to when horses are on, for instance, that dairy pasture we just showed you an example of. Dairy pasture is inevitably over 3% potassium. Sort of ordinary pasture is over 2%. Um, hay in general is under 2%, but as I said, late cut hay tends to be closer to 1%, which is good. Now, the thing is about forage uh, is that, you know, plants love potassium. They tend to luxury uptake way more than what they actually require. And they also have no, at the same time, have no requirement for sodium, for salt. Plants don't have a nervous system to run. So they don't uptake salt like, uh, you know, in anywhere near enough quantities to, you know, to satisfy the requirements of large grazing mammals like, or herbivores like horses and cattle. And this is where, you know, plants like lucerne come in because lucerne is a legume and it's over 2%. Uh, uh, potassium content and it therefore adds to the load so if your horse is already out on cool season grasses he's already has a chronically high potassium intake and then if you add lucerne you're just adding to the load which is enough sometimes to tip horses over into issues that they may not have otherwise you know shown up now, so what, you know, we very much have to be mindful of potassium because sure, horses have great kidneys for uh, adrenal glands and kidneys for dealing with excess potassium and they do excrete it. But when it's, you know, they're actually adapted to temporary spikes. Remember we said that horses don't see much green maybe sporadically during the year or just in the spring. Whereas what we're subjecting them to is like a chronic assault all year round. And uh, that puts a stress on their adrenals and kidneys to be constantly excreting potassium, conserving sodium. So we have to beware drought breaking rains, especially when you get a drought where the ground cracks. Because what happens then is the oxygen gets into the soil and when you when it rains, you are adding moisture and of course that causes an explosion of microbial activity and you'll get extremely toxic green grass shoots 
coming out of the ground very fast, that fluorescent sort of color, and they are toxically high in nitrates and potassium. And that can be lethal to all livestock. So you, you definitely do not want your horses eating that kind of uh, short green grass. Now, when it comes to species, there are a wide variety of species that, that are fabulous for horses. Um, we, we don't, of course, want the high production grasses like ryegrass. So you need to be able to recognize ryegrass you need to be able to recognize the little alternate seed heads on that long stem in the picture there. And the other way to recognize ryegrass is the fact that it is the only grass that shines in the sun. So on a sunny day, you can look across your field or your paddock and you can see what proportion of the grass is ryegrass because it'll be shiny. <coughs> Excuse me. But otherwise, any... All, pretty well all the other species are good so long as they're at a mature stage of growth. Now we go into all the different species on the website under desirable species. You can have a look up there later. Now a lot of people, and we did, we had the idea years ago that, right, we'll, we'll get rid of the, um, the rye grass and clover and we'll sow these more horse-friendly grasses. And of course, you know, we were told at the time, of course, you want to throw in a handful of plantain and some chicory and maybe a bit of clover here and there. Well, we all did that. And of course, what we found was that what you sow is not necessarily what grows. And of course, for a start, if you're sowing soils that have previously been fertilized and grown plants like ryegrass and clover, then your older more natively type grasses won't establish, but your legumes and broad leaves will easily. And what happens is they tend to outcompete the grasses, and you end up with paddock or fields full of plantain and clover, and you know, with a bit of grass scattered through instead of the other way around. So now we don't advise including those plants or any broad leaves or legumes in your seed mixes, you'll always get a few of those plants growing up amongst your grass anyway without needing to sow them and risk having your, your fields taken over with undesirable species. So a mature stage of growth is actually your friend. You know, the, the picture on the left there, we wouldn't sleep at night if our horses were out eating uh, grass that looks like that. It's growing in sort of wettish soils and it's full of um, looks like some some little broadleaf plant uh, and it's at a very young vegetative stage of growth. High potassium, high crude protein, I don't know, probably high sugars as well. Whereas the field on the right there is mature sort of uh, natively looks like brown top type grass and that would make great hay or you might be able to let your horses out there to graze you still got to be a bit wary because if your horse does have a metabolic disorder or is prone to laminitis or EMS or head flicking you've got to check what's growing underneath because it might look like that on the surface but when you walk through it uh, especially if you've had a bit of rain, you might see that grass coming to life again underneath. Other aspects of the grass that you need to be mindful of, um, and talking again, going back to your clovers and your legumes like lucerne, they contain hormonally active compounds, otherwise known as phytoestrogens. Now these will really upset the cycling of mares. They can even affect geldings and turn geldings into, you know, cause stallion-like behavior, hounding of other horses, etc. cetera. Um, and you, what you find is when you eliminate these plants from the diet, you never have trouble with uh, hormonally, uh, hormonal mares or moody mares. Now we've got seven mares that we used to have before like our horses are in their 20s now. So we used to have them before 
we made these management changes. Before, when they were grazing ryegrass and clover, they the, every spring was a nightmare. They would all come into raging seasons. You'd hear the squealing, kicking, striking. There'd be embarrassing behavior. Um, there'd be sometimes goo coming out their back end and gunking up their tail and their white socks. But since, I don't know, 12 or so years that we've been keeping our horses the way that we are recommending you do, on a very high hay diet, only letting them out on mature grass, no legumes or clovers in their diet. Do you know what our comment is? Our comments are, gee, did they even come into season? And of course they do. You know, every now and then you see the signs, but it's nothing like what it used to be. And we we never say now that we, you know, we can understand why people say they, they don't want to have mares. They just want a gelding. Our mares are just the same as our geldings. Now, fluorescing pigments, plants that are very dark green, like your legumes, your clovers, your lucerne, and, uh, and ryegrass, and you know some of the other plants out there, plantain, they contain more of what they call fluorescing or photodynamic pigments. And when the horses consume these, they cause the mud fever and sunburn. Not something we're gonna go into again tonight, but once again, when you eliminate those from the diet, you don't have to worry about the, your horse's white nose out in the sun. We've got very hot sun here in New Zealand. We've got horses with white faces. We used to be out there every morning with the filter back. Now there's absolutely no need and we don't get the mud fever either. Mycotoxins, you do need to be mindful of, especially if you live in humid areas or regions or where, you know, at times of the year when it's humid. Now, uh, fungi produce mycotoxins when they're stressed. And so at certain times of the year, usually late summer, autumn, or, you know, like I say, depending on the, the weather, you know, this particular year, then you would act, add a toxin binder. But at first, you know, when we first uh, were going into the whole grass thing, we thought we sort of put everything down to mycotoxins and we would feed toxin binders. And sure, they did help sometimes. But what we actually found was that uh, their mineral imbalances, uh, you know, trump everything when it comes to causing you know, the issues that we were having with our horses. So mycotoxins, one small aspect. So can you balance to forage? Well, you, it's a nice idea, but obviously you can't when there's any green growing grass in the horse's diet because that grass changes with the season, with the weather, um, you know, and with all sorts of um all sorts of things so you it's it's not that simple it's not a matter of just topping up what is lacking because you have excesses in the pasture grass that cannot be taken out and elements like potassium compete for absorption with magnesium so how do you take that into account Potassium also interferes with calcium metabolism so that, you know, all your calculations can be thrown out of whack. You possibly can when the diet is 100% hay that you've bought from one source. But what we find in actual fact that it's just not necessary to uh, be analyzing and trying to top up uh, or trying to balance to your horse's forage. What you do need to um, make sure that you do properly is properly nourish the horse, especially when he's on a high hay diet. We want to feed that late cut hay so that they've got something to eat all day. Um, but we also need to make sure that they get the five major food groups, the fiber or carbs, the proteins, the fats, the minerals and vitamins. And of course, you need to feed those in a daily feed because we are keeping horses confined 
uh, you know, our modern day domestic horses. So we want a hay based diet, feed as much hay as you can. Uh, we realize that people, you know, a lot of people are renting, grazing, and they're restricted. They might want to um, take more steps, but they are restricted by their grazing arrangements. But unless you've got grass like that picture on the right, which is only available for some of the year anyway, then you need to make sure that you feed more hay every day. We used to only feed hay in the winter when we, you know, when it was absolutely necessary. I don't know, maybe we're trying to save money or whatever. But nowadays, you know, we realize that that's not an uh, necessary not necessarily a cost saving exercise. So it's actually far better for your health, uh, for your horse's health, if you feed them hay much more of the year. So we <clears throat> advocate the oil seeds for a source of protein that is non nitrate protein. So uh, we steer clear of rapeseed because that seems to be quite high in the uh, hormonally active compounds, but uh, the oil seeds like flaxseed, linseed, sunflower, they seem to work really well. And of course, you need to feed a high spec, broad spectrum uh, supplement with minerals, vitamins, amino acids to make sure that they get the lysine, methionine, threonine that can be lacking in those uh, protein sources we just talked about. And of course, you need to be adding your salt. So your horse does need a feed every day uh, with his actual nutrition. You know, a lot of people think that they're giving nutrition when they're actually just feeding a random collection of this and that. So what you've got to make sure is you're feeding actual essential nutrients that the horse needs. Now, the best solution that you can, if you can possibly manage it, is to create a mini desert. You can do that by making, if you, well, easily if you own your own property, because you can make some kind of a dry lot or a track. Now, whether it's a dry lot or a track, it doesn't really matter. It just needs to be big enough that it allows for company for the horse that it allows for plenty of movement. That's why tracks are good because they go somewhere. Um, they're really good if they can go all the way around, but you don't necessarily have to get that done the first year. Um, do what you can and then build on it. Uh, any kind of living environment that you're making for your horse needs to you know, offer the horse choices of shade and shelter. So he can decide of a day, oh, I'm a bit hot, I can go and stand in the shade. Uh, we want to be able to give the horses that quality of life. And like I was saying, it can be a work in progress. But what you don't want to end up in, you know, with is like the picture in the top left there with the blue cross. You're far better off covering up the dirt because, believe me, we've, we've done this um, and for many years. And if you don't cover up the dirt, then... Every time you look around, every time there's been some rain, some sunshine, everywhere you've fed out hay, you see those little green fluorescent shoots coming up again. And then you've got to go and do something about that. Whereas if you can cover up the track, your area, uh, then, you know, obviously that solves that problem. So do it once, do it right. And uh, do what you can for now. and you know, every year you can make it a bit better. So use what you have. Some people have got little pine plantations on their properties. They make great uh, dry lots. Of course, you've got to go through and you've got to remove any branches or sticks or hazards that might, you know, cause the horse's injury. You've got to do that meticulously. And this is one of our tracks here at Calm Healthy Horses. We've got one that doubles as an exercise track. Uh, we got that idea off Sue, our UK distributor. And it works fantastically because obviously over the years we've collected these case study horses and we can't ride them all. 
Uh, and so we exercise them around the exercise track uh, that takes care of that. So making tracks and dry lots actually turns out to be, uh, you know, great layouts for small acreages because you can keep the horse around the edge, which gives you the whole middle to, to do other things with. You can grow your hay, you can ride on it, you can graze it with horses, you know, at certain times of the year. And of course, <clears throat> excuse me, it having such a layout, having the grass-free options is a way that you can keep your grass-affected horses, your EMS, your ones that are prone to laminitis or the ones that have, you know, you think might be PSSM or that have maybe been head shakers or have got sacroiliac problems, et cetera, et cetera. You can keep them safe. You can keep them as reliable, you know, riding horses that you can count on. The horses can make their own choices. And, of course, what we're hoping is that more and more people who rent grazing are going to take on board these ideas. That's Kathy's track at the bottom. You can see she's just got a load of wood chips in that spread around to cover up the majority of the grass on her track. Now, there's some wonderful track liveries around in the UK now and even a couple starting up in New Zealand. So if you do have a horse that has got a serious issue, you can send them to these track liveries, PB, Three Ravens, for instance, uh, and they can um, rehab your horse while you are setting up your own system at home. So what we're talking about here is where we want horses to thrive and not just survive. If you've got um, dry lot options, you can actually take on horses that have got issues and you can take, th take them through the process and, you know, get them back to their fabulous, um, fun-loving, energetic selves. Just like George in the picture here, he came. He came with lots of issues, and uh, but they all disappeared when we um, applied the very principles that we're uh, expounding to you. So what you need to do is adjust your horse's forage so that it's predominantly brown, um, mature grass or hay, rather than dark green, young, vegetative uh, grass. So when you do get it right for the horse, the benefits are endless. Uh, what you'll find is uh, uh, once, you know, uh, over about a year that your horse's hooves will be absolutely fantastic. You won't need shoes anymore because they grow down these amazingly strong um, hooves. Your horse will be a lot nicer to ride. Um, you'll be more comfortable to ride. You'll enjoy taking them out more. You'll have more time to ride. Um, but what we want to emphasize here that the whole subject is something that you need to work at. It's a bit like learning to ride, learning how to feed your horse in your situation on your property or wherever you're keeping them um, is a, a project. And, you know, it's like learning to ride. You don't learn in one lesson. You observe, you compare, you adjust, you review, and you just keep working at it until you get it right. And we're here to help you if you if you would like help in those areas. So that about sums everything up. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been useful information for you. So good night.